G'day, Chris here and welcome back to ClickSpring. As I approach the end of the Skeleton Clock project, it's time to start work on a crucial part of the mechanism, the escapement. Generally speaking, the escapement is considered to be the pallets and the escape wheel, but there are usually a few extra components required to make the whole thing work, and it's those related components that I'm making in this video. There's an eccentric bushing that permits a small adjustment of the pallet depthing with the escape wheel, enabling fine tuning of the escapement. And then there's the crutch assembly, which receives the energy released by the escapement and transmits it to the pendulum to keep it moving. For materials, I'll use a small piece of this thin brass sheet to make the crutch fork, and a selection of rod stock to make most of the other parts. The exception is the pallet arbor that I completed back in episode 12. So let's get started. The crutch assembly clamps onto the pallet arbor, and is itself a small sub-assembly consisting of three parts. The fork that embraces the pendulum block, the arm and the upper fitting. Now this upper fitting has some complex features crammed into quite a tight space. And given that it's such a small part, it's a great candidate to be formed on this small lathe. Once centred in the four jaw chuck, I gave the stock a quick facing cut and then formed the central hole that'll accept the crutch arm. Next I removed the headstock and set up the lathe for its rather unusual method of forming a taper, in this case an included angle of 20 degrees. With the taper formed, I transferred the work to the mill to put in the other features. The embryo part can now be cut from the parent stock to form the small clamping slot. But before I make the slot, here's a closer look at the fastener hole. One half has been drilled for clearance, and the other half is at the correct diameter to be tapped for the fastener thread. The slitting saw takes out the transition point between the two inside diameters, leaving the small diameter isolated on one side and ready for tapping. Back on the lathe, a facing cut reduces the part to size, and leaves a clean cut on that upper surface. A light touch with an oil stone takes care of the sharp corners to complete the part. OK, so that's the top fitting taken care of, now for the fork. Wilding's plans have the arm connected directly to the fork with a spot of silver solder. But I've modified the design to have this little extension to receive the arm. It's not that much of a change, but it should make the join to the fork a bit stronger, and perhaps a bit neater too. I've turned a small spigot on the end of this extension to securely register the parts together as they're joined. That spigot will also serve another useful purpose which you'll see in a moment. The base of the fork is a simple sheet metal profile, and I'm using the template method to mark out the stock. The scroll saw makes short work of this thin brass sheet, and the belt sander brings it quickly to the line. Now soft solder would probably be quite adequate for this join, but given the nature of the intersection, I don't want there to be any doubts around its strength. 
so I'm going to use some of this combination flux and silver solder paste to do the job. It's a very convenient way to accurately position flux and hard solder around a small join like this one. I've got the work set up on this pumice stone to protect the bench and the heat is being supplied using a small butane torch. Up close you can see the flux run, leaving behind a tiny matrix of silver solder adjacent to the join. A little more heat and then that solder melts and wicks into the small gap between the parts, while the excess solder forms a nice fillet. The part can be cleaned up with some acid pickle, but in this case I'd like to take a light pass with a cutter to bring up a fresh metal surface. So I'm using a super glue arbor to hold the workpiece and that small spigot I mentioned previously to locate the part on the central axis of the lathe. Some whisper thin cuts with a universal cutting tool remove the flux and reveal some fresh metal. And I'm happy enough with the tool finish for this part so I'll leave that as the final surface. The spigot has done its job so that can be taken off with some abrasive paper, leaving a grained surface finish on that underside surface. The final step for this part is to use needle files and abrasive paper to bring the perimeter to the final shape and dimension. As for the upper fitting, a light touch with an oil stain breaks the sharp edges, leaving a presentable edge. And that completes the fork. Next up is the arm of the subassembly, which is a nice straightforward part made from thin rod stock. The plans specify brass rod, but I'm using drill rod of the same dimension for the material contrast. Once cut to length, I tidied up the ends on the belt sander to make them a good fit into each of the crutch fittings. The bend locations are positioned roughly one third in from each end, and it really is just as simple as getting a good hold of it in the vise and giving it a careful push until it's about right. The three parts of the crutch assembly are now complete, so a small spot of Loctite on each end is all that's required to bond them together.
Okay, now to the eccentric bushing. And this component can be thought of as an optional extra. It's not strictly required. The pallet arbor could simply be planted at the correct distance and left as is. But it's a very helpful addition to the clock mechanism to permit fine adjustment to the pallet depthing, particularly as the pallets begin to wear after a few years. You'll get a closer look at its function in the next video, when I use it during the initial setup to minimise the drop onto the entry pallet. I started work on the part by forming the basic profile, and then it was transferred to the mill to form the pivot hole. The central axis of the part was located with a wiggler, and then a tiny offset was introduced to the spindle, so that the hole would be formed off-centre as the name of the part suggests. I drilled undersize at this stage, so that I could broach out the hole to fit the pivot later. And I used this roller cutter to form an oil sink. In this case, I made it quite deep to account for the fact that I'll be facing the part once the screwdriver slot has been formed. I formed the screwdriver slot just clear of the oil sink, and then took the part back to the lathe to be faced to length. And at this point, whilst the overall profile of the part is okay, the entry and exit points need a bit of a tidy up. So after a quick clean up in some denatured alcohol, I used a handheld countersink and an oil stone to break all of the edges. The last of the parts to be made are the fasteners. In this case, I need two to hold the bushing in place and one to clamp the crutch assembly onto the pallet arbor. All three were made in the same way that you've seen in previous videos using the small lathe. They were then hardened and tempered and then polished and blued. OK, with the fasteners complete, I can start to put a few of the bits and pieces together. Now in a previous video, I opened up the pallet arbor pivot hole in the front frame as I positioned the regulator and suspension post. At the same time, I spot marked the rear pivot position. So this time, I re-identified that position using a wiggler, and then with the required offset dialed in, I drilled and reamed the hole to accept the eccentric bushing. The two fastener holes were also formed and tapped. And for the last powered cut on the frames, I formed the oil sink for the previously drilled front frame pivot hole. A quick deburr of the whole perimeter and the eccentric bushing can be installed, along with the adjacent fasteners. As I did for the other pivot holes of the clock, I used clockmaker's brooches to open up the holes to fit the pallet arbor pivots. And like before, I'm aiming for a decent amount of angular freedom, particularly since the eccentric bushing can introduce an additional offset angle depending on where it sits in its rotation.
And once it looked about right, I put the frames back together to give it all a test fit. There's a bit of end shake for the pallet arbor and the crutch assembly coasts to a gentle stop, indicating minimum friction. I've left the barest clearance between the crutch fork and the pendulum block to minimise energy loss. And the eccentric bushing is ready to be adjusted as required in the next episode. Which leaves just a few key components to be made before I can set the clock running. Thanks for watching. I'll see you later. And if you've just made your way into this clock making series, thanks for checking it out. This is just one episode of a longer series where I show all of the steps to make a mechanical clock from raw metal stock, so be sure to check out those other videos. If you'd like to help me bring you more project videos like this one, then consider becoming a Clickspring patron. As a patron of the channel, you get access to exclusive patron-only video content, free plans for the patron projects, and the chance to win the actual project at the end of each build. Like for example, this useful little hand vise. Find out more by visiting patreon.com forward slash clickspring. And finally, if you're looking for some new projects for your lathe or mill, then take a moment to visit clickspringprojects.com, where you'll find a range of plans available for download, including plans for some of the tools I've made to help me construct this clock. Thanks again for watching. I'll catch you on the next video.